Hello everyone and welcome to Six Pack of Facts, a weekly way of expanding your brain, six refreshing facts at a time. My name is Alex and this week we've got surprisingly historic and scientific flying objects and the things that keep them aloft. Let's take a look at kites and pressure systems. Well, there's no concrete origin of kites. The earliest writing of even a kite-like thing dates back to more than 2,000 years ago. The account states that General Han Xin of China's Han Dynasty flew a kite over the walls of a city he was attacking to measure how far his troops would have to dig to breach the defenses. In another account, General Jim Yu Sin of the Shilla Dynasty in Korea used a kite in a clever way to rally his army. His troops refused his orders to fight against a rebellion after they saw a shooting star in the sky, a sign they took to be a bad omen of what was to come. The general then used a kite to carry fire into the sky, returning the star to its rightful place and causing his troops to regain their metal. Although kites rose in the east, thanks to trading between China, Korea, India, and the Middle East, they took flight on the global stage. Throughout the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries, Kite flying reached across the land and made its way to Europe. While children did enjoy the hobby, kites took on a different purpose when they caught the attention of scientists. In 1749, Alexander Wilson, a Scottish meteorologist, lifted thermometers high into the air to measure air temperatures at various altitudes. The experiment is simple, but it shows just how much kites expanded the reach of scientists at the time. Of course, the most famous of these was Benjamin Franklin's shocking experiment with lightning. And while you're probably generally familiar with it, it has some interesting elements that are a little more obscure. Franklin did fly a kite on a string, but he wasn't alone, and the kite didn't get struck by lightning. Dear old Ben probably wouldn't have made it had it been. Benjamin was actually joined in the experiment by his son, William. Knowing the dangers of metal conductivity, Benjamin devised a very clever setup. A hemp string attached to the kite was allowed to get wet in the rain. Tied to the string was the infamous key, but Benjamin wasn't holding the end of that string. Instead, it was attached to a Leyden jar, a component that stores electrical charge. A silk string was attached to the Leyden jar as well, which was safely and dryly held by William as he stood inside of a barn. This prevented the silk string from getting wet, insulating William and protecting him from shock. Even though there was no direct lightning strike, Benjamin noticed the fibers of the kite string fraying away from one another, leading him to believe the Leyden jar was being charged. His assumption was proved when he moved his finger close to the key and felt a shock, thus proving the electrical nature of lightning. To cap off kites, let's do a rapid-fire round of some amazing kite records courtesy of the good old Guinness World Record book which has a great history of its own. You should really listen to the Gold and Guinness episode if you haven't. The highest kite ever flown, officially at least, there are writings of other supposed feats, was achieved in 2014 in Australia. Robert Moore and his team, and an industrial winch, flew a kite almost 16,000 feet in the air, nearly half the cruising altitude of commercial airliners. The largest kite was created and very briefly flown at a festival in Kuwait in 2005. The kite measured about 80 feet by 130 feet, bigger than the size of the crowd that was gathered to see it. Junior high students in Aichi, Japan, achieved the record for number of kites flown at once in 1998. The kids gathered on Kojima Beach and tied 15,585 kites to a long rope at intervals of about 28 centimeters and watched as they all eventually were carried into the air at once. Lastly, a team from Edmonds Community College in Washington State holds the record for the longest kite flight. By working in shifts, the team was able to keep their kite in the air for 180 hours and 17 minutes, more than a full week. None of those kite feats could have been accomplished without one thing. Wind. And where there's wind, there are pressure systems. The 
The sun doesn't heat our planet evenly. Air at the equator, where more sunlight reaches, is warmer than air toward the poles. The light equatorial air rises and migrates to the poles, while the polar air sinks and makes its way to the equator. And all that would happen very neatly if the planet wasn't spinning. All that spinning, or the Coriolis force, twists up these rising and falling air currents. A low pressure system contains lower pressure at its center than the area around it, and its winds spiral inward. As the warm air rises, it cools, and because colder air has less capacity to carry water vapor, clouds and precipitation are created. This is why low pressure systems are commonly associated with storms. High pressure systems, on the other hand, are associated with calmer, clearer weather. As higher altitude in these systems falls, it reaches the lower and warmer regions of the atmosphere that can hold more water vapor. Water droplets that would otherwise contribute to the formation of precipitation and clouds typically evaporate, creating clear weather. Of course, we wouldn't be able to remotely measure these high and low systems if it wasn't for one device, the barometer. In 1641, Evangelista Torricelli, an assistant to Galileo, was performing vacuum experiments with mercury when he noticed something curious. The height of the mercury in the vacuum was changing day to day. Torricelli had just inadvertently invented the first barometer. When the open end of a glass vial was placed into a pool of mercury, the metal would rise into the tube thanks to atmospheric pressure. The higher the pressure, the higher the mercury would rise. Why mercury? Its density makes it a much more manageable material for the task than something less dense, such as water. For instance, at sea level, mercury will rise to a height of almost 30 inches. Under the same conditions, water would rise to nearly 34 feet. Finally, let's talk a little bit about one of my favorite words ever. Meteorologists generally consider atmospheric pressure to be holding steady if it changes less than 0.1 millibars in less than three hours. But sometimes it can change much quicker than that. When a system's pressure drops at least 24 millibars in 24 hours, some truly impressive storms can be conjured up. This typically happens when a large mass of cold air meets a large mass of warm air. And when it does, it's called bombogenesis. Bombogenesis. So cool. That said, the phenomenon isn't all that rare. Between 40 and 50 storms undergo bombogenesis every year. Still, awesome word, right? And there you have it. Kites that fly through the air and the pressure systems that make it all possible. Thanks for listening, but come on. Stop wasting time listening to me and just go fly a kite. Until the next six-pack effects, as always, stay thirsty.